So um, I'll do a little live Facebook thing and, and do that up there since we can't seem to get it going here. Um, but those are the three winners. So that's really exciting. And they'll go out in the mail as soon as um, I get the addresses, which we're working on. Um, all right. So Surefoot Equine Practitioners. Basically what happened is I started doing this and realized that I needed a team. But more importantly, um, I went to Equitana in Essen, Germany in 2015 and then again in 2017. In 2017, I had a woman named Brynja Rydell who uh, speaks very good English and German because her family summers in Canada. So we didn't have a language problem. And she came in and stayed with me for nine days at my booth at Equitana. And of course we bonded. Um, Brynja is an animal physical therapist. And so we realized that we um, needed people to be able to reach more horses. Um, the decision is, and still stands, that you need to be an equine professional of some degree, um, whether that's you're, you're already um, an equine professional, you're a massage therapist, body worker, trainer, physical therapist, um, but you need to be a professional to be an, a surefoot equine professional. And the reason for that is that we're not teaching all of the skills required to work with horses. We're simply teaching the skills of how to use surefoot. So it's really important that anyone that's going to be a practitioner has the background and understanding in safety and horse, you know, horses in general, is used to being around horses, has um, dealt with horses that aren't always cooperative. Um, and so that base level of experience, which we are not teaching, um, we feel is super important that people have that to be a surefoot equine practitioner. So what we're doing is we're training the particular skill set of how to use surefoot. And um, yeah, and oh, Germany, yeah. And so since 2015, we start, started doing trainings over there. No, sorry, 2017. So it's been basically four years um, because it was March. Uh, we have a whole team of practitioners in Germany. Um, I'm not even sure how many we have at this point because Brynja Rydell and Roland Weiss and Felice, um, Felice Deppler are our four hoof people and Sandra Faust are our four hoof people in Europe. So um, Brynja and Roland are in Germany and um, Sandra and Felice are in Switzerland, but Felice also goes to Sweden and she also is spearheading Sure Paws. She's done a ton with dogs. She works with sled dogs in Sweden. So um, she's been really instrumental in pushing me to move forward on the Sure Paws project and, and it is moving forward. Um, right now I've had to get the Surefoot Equine website up and running. So the Sure Paws website, um, we've secured the name and it'll be coming along. So I just need a little more time. Um, so the practitioners are, as I said, they're equine professionals and what they do is um, there's four different levels. Um, and what I'll do in a minute is I'll take you over to the Surefoot Equine website where you can find this information. Um, but there are four different levels and we call them hooves, we kind of fit. So there's one hoof, two hoof, three hoof, four hoof, and I'm a four hoof plus, um, so, cause I created it. So a one hoof can use Surefoot in their private practice for financial gain. In other words, you can use Surefoot with a client, you can charge for that. Um, one of the questions that I get most frequently is what should I charge? And what I tell people is that whatever you're charging for your services at this point, because the market is so different, I mean, we're international, we're all around the world, that I don't advise people as to what to charge for that service. I usually tell them to charge whatever you are already charging. This is just another one of your tools in your kit. And, and some people feel that it's valuable enough that they raise their prices and other people just include it as one of their services. And the reason for that is you can be working with a horse with surefoot pads and maybe it only lasts about 10 minutes. Um, but it, you know, then you can go on and do some of your other techniques um, because sometimes the horses only want the pads for 10 minutes. Um, sometimes the horses want the pads for an hour and a half. Uh, I've seen that as well. But you know, there isn't a time frame on it. So trying to put a, a charge for surefoot, it, it just doesn't work. It's, you know, every population and environment is different. We have people in Australia, Canada, Europe, um, Japan. So um, that is up to you, just including that as one of your services. So one hoof can use Surefoot in private 
in their private practice. Uh, a two hoof, and this is still, um, so the information on the website is still a work in progress. I'm still sorting out the two hoof a little bit. Um, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, two hoof can do surefoot pad parties, what we call surefoot pad parties, and small demos. So a surefoot pad party is a great way for people to kind of get used to working with a group. And basically, it's a small group, you know, uh, for an hour, and you're having one, maybe two horses in the arena at a time, not more than that. Um, and the owner is there, there's no auditors, it's not public in that regard. And basically think Tupperware party, okay? Um, Hansha Roll, our three hoof in um, the Netherlands, came up with this idea. Um, and it's really great because one of the questions that I get most frequently is, what pad should I use with my horse? And what we know is I can give you all the advice in the world, but your horse is gonna tell you which one he wants. Um, and it's rather pricey to buy the whole package, especially if you just have one or two horses. Um, so it's a great way for your clients to see how their horse responds to the pads, see which pads the horse likes the best. And so Surefoot pad parties are super low key, no auditors, you know, a small group of people with their horses, um, basically just kind of exploring and seeing what the horse is like. Um, it's very no pressure. Um, and it's been wildly popular over in Europe. Um, uh, Hansha's doing pad parties all the time in Holland. Um, she gets a small group together, travels around, goes and works with the small group. Um, it's really great. Um, and like I said, low key, really easy, no pressure. Uh, a three hoof can do workshops and larger demos, and a four hoof can train other equine professionals to do surefoot. So um, when I say demos, this is what has uh, ca caused me to kind of sit back a little bit with the two hoof, because it, I used to say that two hooves could do demos. Um, but last summer, I was in Holland, and I was asked to do a two hour demo, and it was in front of a group of 100 people. And um, let's see, the guy who was doing sound only spoke Dutch. We had a handheld mic and I had a headset on. Um, he checked the volume and then he left to go drive his ponies. So we could see him driving past the door on the outside of the arena. Um, the horse that was my first horse was 18 hands. The woman had only had him for about two weeks. He was quite stressed and he knew how to lean his shoulder into people to run them over. And he was 18 hands and I'm five foot, maybe four. Um, but in addition to that, because I started working with him and things were going okay, he was standing on pad, um, something happened with the sound system. And um, there was a, they could, the audience couldn't hear me. Um, so they couldn't hear what I was saying. We thought it was the batteries on the headset, which was strapped to my back. Um, and at the same time that I didn't know, there was a man up in the audience who had hearing aids and he was starting to have like fits. Um, so people are trying to deal with the guy in the audience. The horse suddenly couldn't stand still anymore. I'm trying to keep the audience entertained by continuing to talk while I'm with a horse that absolutely can't stand still and I cannot put on a pad. And at the same time, Hansha is chasing me, trying to change the batteries in my backpack with my headset because we thought it was the batteries on my headset. So um, uh, <laughs> Saskia was on a, on a webinar the other day and she was there at this event and she remembers. Um, so it, it was just crazy. And so I just kept going, you know, you couldn't stand still with the horse, no problem. You kept him moving, Hans just chasing you around, she's switching the batteries. And what we finally found out was you could not have the handheld and the headset on at the same time. But the sound guy never told us this and he was gone. So we couldn't find him to find out. So this went on for, oh, probably 10 minutes. Um, and finally I got the horse stopped and I handed it to the owner and I said, well, maybe, you know, <laughs> we'll look at him later on. Um, so that made me rethink the idea of just simply saying demos for a two hoof level. In the end, what I'm concluding is that you need to have certain skills, whether that's being an equine professional, dealing with groups, presenting to larger groups, those kinds of skills already need to kind of be in your toolkit 
to be able to be at that level for surefoot. And I have to figure out exactly how to word this. But don't worry, I'm working on it. I'm going to have it done. And if anybody has any questions, by the way, just pop them in the chat, OK? Um, because again, we're not here to train you how to do all these other things. Um, life experience, you know, like when I think about how I got started, uh, I was a scientist by training. I have a master's degree in equine reproductive physiology. I was working at the University of Kentucky getting my master's when I had my accident and I met Linda Tellington Jones and decided that I wanted to be a team practitioner. Um, and I'll never forget people looking at me going, you know, you're kind of crazy. You're going to leave, leave all this to go. To, yeah, I am. Um, but I had no skills in presenting in public. I never wanted to work with people. And so, you know, you, you, life is how you get this experience and started out teaching private writing lessons, you know, did more team training, started doing little team things, continued to do more trainings, met Sally Swift, took her instructor course training, continued to do lessons and gradually started working with larger groups and doing clinics. But this was over a period of time. Um, and I apprenticed with Sally in 1992. So it was six years since my first centered riding course that I apprenticed with Sally. Um, and so, you know, it was over time, just working with people and working with more groups and larger groups and different environments and doing small demos and a little TV interview, that I gained the skills necessary to be able to do that demo in Holland last summer. So, um, you know, anyone who wants to move up in the levels, we really want to encourage you to do that. And at the same time, it's really important that you think about developing yourself in a way to have the skills necessary to do this in public, because it's a completely other animal. And I know Suzanne's out there and she'll agree with me, I'm sure. Um, it's a completely different animal to work privately with someone than to work with, um, a large audience, a difficult horse, a sound system that's going south, and make it all look okay. That's an art. Oh, yeah. Oh, Lord, yes. <laughs> that's from Suzanne. Um, and, you know, as much as you can take classes and learn and train, train your skills, the only way you're ever really going to learn how to deal with groups is to do it. And the only way to do that is to start small um, and just gain experience. So in whatever way, you know, when people are doing this, you know, you might have a job that you have to do public speaking or, um, you know, maybe, you know, you have a, a, a therapeutic riding group and you take a couple of people and you kind of show them what you're doing, you know, casual, um, low key, no stress, no financial gain kind of experiences where you can figure that out. Okay, we'll find, we'll find an address for that. So, um, the difference between a demo and a workshop and a clinic. Yes. All right. So a private is like a private lesson. A demo is an audience. So you have, you are in the arena, probably with or without the owner, depends on whether the horse is mounted or unmounted, and you have an audience. And it can be an audience of five or an audience of 500. It's, it's still the environment of you presenting to an audience. It means you have to be able to manage the horse manage the owner, manage the handlers, manage the audience, manage the PA, all of that, especially if you don't have an assistant. Um, that's a very different animal and not everybody's good at public speaking, not everybody's entertaining uh, as a public speaker. So um, as you can tell, um, I'm very entertaining in public speaking um, and I have been for years. Uh, and um, so it works for me. But a lot of people have a, a lower affect. They're either quieter or a little more, I hate to use the word introverted, but just quieter, um, doesn't, don't project your voice really well and that sort of thing. And it makes it more difficult to, for the audience to track, especially when they're at a distance and can't really see what's happening at the hoof level. Um, you know, right now everybody's on Zoom and doing webinars and seminars and meetings. And so I'm sure if you've kind of gone out and watched a bunch of these, you'll see different styles. Um, uh, my style is very interactive with my guests. I, you know, I'll interrupt them, I'll ask a question, I'll add a little anecdote. Um, uh, I keep it kind of alive. Whereas uh, recently I went to watch one and I turned it off after five minutes because 
I couldn't stand it. It was just, you know, uh, very monotone and not very, and the woman was doing things like, you know, put your hands under your seat bones. Well, you couldn't see her seat bones and she didn't have a little skeleton. Neville's always next to me. Oops, he's in the, there we go. Um, so, you know, that's difficult and people may not be able to see or, you know, the horse might not be doing what you thought it was gonna do. Maybe he won't stand on the pads. And so in a demo, you've got to be able to roll with the punches, keep the crowd entertained, make sure everybody stays safe, number one in all of this. Um, and, you know, entertain people because that's really why people are there. Um, there's education, entertainment. So I have three words I always use when I teach, safe, fun, and educational in that order, in that order. Safe, fun, and educational. Um, you're qualified. Um, <laughs> you know, boarding barn owner and manager. I have five horses and plan to buy pads. My boarders are interested and would like to know what you recommend. Uh, hang on a second. I can't read the rest of this chat. Uh, what I recommend that I say, I would say get people together and watch the DVD or get people together and watch the, U the YouTube channel um, quick start guide or just give them an assignment. You guys go watch the quick start guide before we get together and do this. Um, and that's totally fine to do that, you know, like a little barn party kind of a thing. Again, low key, no financial gain involved, um, just exploring. And the key is to stay safe. If you see something, um, my biggest rule is hands stay away from the hoof. Um, and so this takes me back to training practitioners. I don't care how often I say it or how often I show it. What I need to see is what you do because I have very highly trained professionals that come to a two-day Surefoot workshop to become a Surefoot practitioner, and I see their hand at the hoof. And the reason that I am so particular about this, I have two reasons. One, many years ago, I was with a pony club kid, and she, we were doing some stretches with her horse, and I was at the head and she was at the foot, and she had her hand down on the foot, and the horse stepped down and took the end of her finger off, and so we spent her birthday in the hospital. Um, and so that was traumatic for me, and I've never forgotten it. So I have PTSD about fingers and foot, feet. Um, the other thing is that whatever you do is what people are going to model, not what you say. So if you are modeling that your hand is down by the foot, then that's what they're going to do. They're going to do it anyway. And so the best we can do is give them a good example. Um, the third reason actually, and there's three, I just realized the third reason is that when you're down there putting your hand down by the hoof, trying to tuck the pad in, you're very vulnerable because you're quite bent over. And if the horse becomes unstable, He's going to try and take care of himself, and you might be where you're going to get hurt. So my rule of thumb is if you take one hand and put it on your lower back, you only have one hand to work with to pick up the leg. And I typically use the cannon bone, and then I position the pad with my foot and kick it into place and set the foot down. And that way, it's very simple, when you only have one hand to work with, you won't be able to have a pad and a hand. So you won't be with down by the hoof with your hand. Um, and you know, that's the thing is I never want any horse or person to be injured doing surefoot. Um, so safety is my, you know, I'm very, very particular about that. And it's the reason why when people say, well, can I qualify people to be surefoot practitioners through Zoom meetings and webinars and videos? No, because as much as I tell you this, I've seen it enough to know that when I watch you live with a horse, I'm gonna see you do the unconscious things, the things you're not even aware of. And one of the big things I'm watching is, is your hand down by the foot? And as a professional, you, you know, and I teach farriers, I mean, I, I had a hammer. <laughs> you know, I teach these people who are used to handling feet. I'm not worried about you as a professional getting hurt by handling the feet. I'm concerned about the individual owner who watches you and then goes and tries to do it. So, you know, teach by example, keep your hand away from the foot, use your foot to position the pad. It's on all my educational information, all my quick start guides, go back and watch them again. You're gonna see that that's exactly what I talk about because the three reasons are, you know, safety, safety, safety. <laughs> and, um, 
it's just really important. I, um, and if you, I'm just, UPS guy is supposed to pick up a box, so I'm just peeking to see if he, that was him. It's not. Um, so if you practice safe handling, you're going to emulate safe handling, and that's going to hopefully keep everybody safe. And again, the reason I'm not going to do this all virtually is because I have seen enough with very experienced practitioners, and, and especially like the, the farriers and barefoot trimmers, they're so unconsciously used to handling the foot that they're down there with their hands. And the owner's going to see that, and then the owner's going to try and do that, and then something could happen. Okay, so um, a clinic is for the public where it's um, people bring their horses. Um, and Elizabeth, I think you were at the, the one that I did at Morgan Park many years ago. I had two horses in the arena at a time. I had a handler or a rider with the horse and I'm teaching them how to do surefoot with their horses. So a demo, everybody's in the stands, a clinic, you have people in the arena. So it, I might have say 12 people, two with horses and the others also placing pads underneath horses feet. They are owners, they are interested people, they are volunteers at therapeutic riding centers and they are not interested in becoming surefoot practitioners. They simply want to learn better technique, to learn which pads to use, to become better observers, because observation is so key to being able to know what's going on. So it's for the public. Um, it's hands-on with participants actually in the arena. So now we have a level, another level of um, safety concern that you have to be able to be aware of what other people are doing while you're working with someone else. So eyes in the back of your head. Um, you're over here working with this horse, placing pads so you're bending down, you know, and you're looking at this horse and some participants over here working with this other horse and they're not paying attention and doing something. So you have to be able to be aware. It's a really good idea to have some helpers, some assistants to be, have more eyes on, but it is a hands-on, you may have a level of auditor that is in the stands, not actually in the arena, but a clinic is where you have people in the arena. A workshop is for professionals. So you, you may have non-professional track people at a workshop. In other words, it's not required that you be an equine professional to take the workshop. I get a lot of people, they're just super keen, they love this stuff, they're really interested, they wanna learn more, they have no desire to be a surefoot practitioner, they're not an equine professional in their own life, they're just really interested, keen learners, and they want more. So they can attend, they just will not become a surefoot practitioner. Um, but the professionals are there to learn good technique, to understand the different pads, why you would use them, what horses not to use them with, um, and so um, that's training other professionals. Workshops are training other professionals. Clinics are public participation. Demos are um, an audience and private lesson is a private lesson. So is that clear? Um, if you have any questions about that, just please put it in the chat. Happy to answer those. Um, I, I never wanted to make Surefoot a big hurdle or complicated to attain. In other words, um, there are a lot of systems out there that charge a lot of money for training that um, require a, you know, uh, a lot of practice and um, expense. I mean, there's some trainings that are $2,500 and you don't even get a level. Um, I felt that with Surefoot, it's, it's not that complicated. You need some really good basic rules. You need some really good basic technique. You need some safety skills and what to pay attention to and that sort of thing. But it's, it's not that complicated. So I wanted to make it attainable for people. So um, to be a one hoof, you attend a two day workshop. It's a one time cost. Um, they run, oh, let's see. Depending, I have a flat rate, depending on if there's any additional for the arena and that sort of thing, it's around $350 for a weekend. 
So that's not expensive when you think about what it is in relation to a lot of other trainings. Um, it's two days. There's theory both mornings and then practice. Uh, I really like to have horses that we've never seen before or never been on surefoot pads come for that training. I really like to have a difficult horse, one that somebody's had a, you know, it's, it's a nervous or anxious horse because when you have a workshop where the horses are really easy or are used to the pads, you don't get the experience of working with a horse that may not want to stand on them. And there are horses out there that will not stand on surefoot pads. So having a variety of horses is great, having both mounted and unmounted horses, and that's where um, four hooves can do surefoot workshops to train other professionals. And that's where a four hoof can organize a workshop. Um, the four hooves are independent. I don't regulate them um, in terms of what they charge. I do regulate in terms of the safety aspect and the basic content. Um, and that they work with professionals so that the professionals can use Surefoot in their practice. Um, let me just look at the chat here for a second. Uh, uh, yes, um, somebody's saying um, when you have a barn, you know, as a barn owner, you can get a set for the barn and everybody can pitch in and, and um, purchase the set and use it. So if I want to be a Surefoot practitioner, what do I attend? You attend a workshop. Workshops is for people who want to be practitioners. Um, two days. I had several booked this spring. I had one at Jillian Kreinbrings. I had one in Oxford, Pennsylvania. I have one in Colorado, and there's still one on the books in New Hampshire in July. Um, we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, when, you know, things change, we'll be able to go back to scheduling. I rescheduled Jillian Kreinbrings and Oxford PA, or new Oxford PA, to the fall. Um, it's on my calendar on the Murdoch Method site. And once we get the calendar up and running on the Surefoot Equine site, we'll get it up there. Um, I don't have any planned in Canada at this point, but we have four hooves in Canada who can do them. We have Robin Hood and her daughter, Mandy Pretty. They can both train. They're both four hooves. Um, Debbie Potts is a four hoof in Oregon. Robin uh, Shelton Larson is a four hoof in Australia. So we've got Europe covered. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, I'm East Coast, Debbie's West Coast. She's also a team practitioner and trainer. Um, Robin and Mandy are in Canada. And they're, we're putting everybody up on the site that's a practitioner and what hoof level they are. We're still gathering that information and putting it up there. And we're going to try and make it searchable by hoof level. Um, it's the site's up. And we're still working on it. It'll probably be forever. Um, let's see, if we attend a workshop to become a, what equipment do we need? So when you become a Surefoot practitioner, you sign a document that you agree to only use Surefoot equine pads made by the Murdoch method. Oh, that's my ice machine. Um, and you know, that's only fair. I'm training you to use Surefoot. And so I ask you that you only use Surefoot products. Now, as a practitioner, we give practitioners a discount. So if they want to you know, purchase product or resell product, um, you can do that because we give the practitioners a discount. We do not charge dues. I do all the admin stuff for free, <laughs> okay? So my small request is that you commit to only use Surefoot products. Um, and that's where it works. Okay, do I provide specific materials or guide for what is to be taught in each format, demo clinic? Yes, when you're at that level, we give you, we are, and those are materials, good question, Suzanne. We're working on those materials and Debbie Potts is actually helping me because she's also doing that for the T-Touch people. So um, it's a work in progress and um, we have very, right now we have, I can't remember, I think it's six or seven, four hoofs. We have a few three hoofs over in Europe, um, and we have uh, a couple here in the States, but they've worked very closely with me right now. And so that's what I, once the website's up and running, then I get back to grinding through the admin stuff to have specific documents for, for those. There, we have outlines and we have work in progress. I just have to finish it up. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm very happy to be home for another month because maybe by the time I have another month, I might have everything done. I don't know. 
<laughs> I got too much to do. Um, so um, we also are working on logo specific to each hoof level. So let me screen share, let me get this up and I'll take you over to the Surefoot Equine website that we just launched on Friday. Hopefully, yep, there we go. Um, and I'll do a screen share. All righty. And I'll just close my little window for now. All right, so here we are. Um, and what you'll see is it shows drop down menus for products, resellers. So I have resellers in the United States, Canada, um, Australasia, and Europe. And then we get to practitioners. And under practitioners, we have different regions, right? So we have Australia, New Zealand, Austria, Germany, um, Netherlands, Sweden. We don't have anybody in Italy just yet. United States and Canada. Okay, so let's just go to Canada. When you can see that the hoof level is listed, their qualifications, what they have is listed. And if I scroll down here to Violet, she sent me a picture. And you see this little symbol here. This is the one hoof symbol. And she is a one hoof. And when you click on it, it blows up. We get a nice picture of Violet. And um, depending, we may, we're talking about how much information to put on this particular page. Because as you can see, if we did that for everybody, it's gonna get really long. So we might have a read more um, where we can have descriptions so that people can kind of go um, say a little more about themselves. And that's under practitioners. Okay, um, I also have a category called veterinarians. I, I have several, we just haven't gotten them up on the site yet. But there are, um, stop share for a second. We have veterinarians now in a number of different countries, including the United States, who are huge supporters of Surefoot, who write protocols for rehab with Surefoot pads. Um, we and so I want to acknowledge them and provide uh, people with, you know, if, if you have a horse and um, it's, it needs some kind of therapy or rehab, like Dr. Sherry Johnson, who did a webinar with me and she was fabulous, um, you know, you can't tell to prescribe things without actually seeing the horse, but that's where um, if we have veterinarians, they can go, you can go and get a workup, find out what, you know, is going on with your horse, diagnostics, follow up, and surefoot pads. So um, we have a lot, um, the website address is real simple, it's surefootequine.com. Yep. Um, so, um, you know, we're going to add more veterans, and I have more veterinarians every day that are uh, uh, coming on board. I mean, they're really discovering the benefits of using the pads uh, in rehab. And so um, the sports medicine people are, are really getting it. And actually, I did a demo for um, Dr. Engel, Margie Engel's husband, who's our, one of our show jumping team riders um, down in Florida this winter. Um, so, um, yeah, it's it's really coming along there. All right, so we're gonna go back to my screen share. Okay, so practitioners, and they're listed by regions. Um, if you go to education, you go to hoof levels, and here's where we're gonna describe each of the hoof levels. And so you can see, let me just make that bigger. Okay, each hoof level is a different color and has more feet. So, um, I know it's a little bit uh, kitschy, but it's what we started with. And it's, I, you know, you got to keep it light a little bit sometimes. It's, we, I think we all get a little too serious. So, um, so it's going to have the descriptions of what you can do, you know, at each of the different levels, what the prerequisites are. And I forgot to tell you that you've got to do a certain number of case histories for each level. So uh, for a one hoof, you have, you know, current qualifications, whether, you, you know, a Tellington Touch person, um, Masterson, you attend a two-day workshop. Um, you have to demonstrate safe practices, agree to use Murdoch Method Surefoot products. Um, the registration mark, Surefoot Equine Stability Program is registered, so you have to agree to use the registration mark. Um, and uh, meet approval. So, you know, sometimes, as with all things, um, someone may think that they're really ready to go out there and work with horses professionally. 
Um, and we're just not quite sure yet. So we always wanna make sure whenever anyone is qualified for any level that you're really comfortable and confident. Um, it's to benefit you, it benefits us, and it benefits the horse and the owner. So it's just really important that you feel really solid in what you know and what you're doing. Um, and one of the best ways, honestly, to learn more about Surefoot is to go back and watch the videos that I've put up. Right now they're on the Murdoch Method channel because I, in the beginning I hadn't separated Surefoot out from Murdoch Method, but ultimately I'm gonna move all the Surefoot videos so that they are also accessible on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Um, but I have lots and lots of videos there. Uh, we recorded my lectures that I did for at least one, if not two, Surefoot workshops. Um, the one that I did for uh, just before the team celebration, uh, the T Touch celebration last February in Santa Fe. Uh, Robin recorded it, and that's up there. So there's a lot of at home study that you can do to feel like you're prepared. Because one of the questions you're going to get that I still get, I still can't answer is how does it work? And you know, the bottom line is we, we don't have any actual data to tell us how this is working. Although Martina Neerhart's webinar that I did this week on, my, I think it was Monday, was probably the closest in the eight years I've been doing this, the closest to explaining some of the changes that we see. So Dr. Peter's webinar, understanding the nervous system, the horse, the brain, how it works, that's really helpful. Uh, Dr. Um, Neerhart's information was great more about the foot, but you know, right now, we really don't have any scientific evidence as to how Surefoot works. We just know that it does. Um, but you're gonna get that person that goes, well, what's the evidence and what's the data and how does it work and why should I do this with my horse? And you need to feel comfortable fielding those questions um, because they're gonna, it's gonna happen. Uh, I've been volunteering an equine professional with an EFL program, but have to have to professional training or certification. Um, email me specifically and we can talk. So if you're wondering whether you have the qualifications to be able to take the Surefoot training, the best thing to do, because I'm not sure I understand what EFL is, um, but the best thing to do is just email me. We, we can always have a little chat, either Zoom chat or just talk on the phone and, and see. Um, like I said, you can take the, the workshops even if you're not a a professional um, if you just want you know more information so that's totally possible um, but that's the thing is you're gonna get skeptics and you're gonna get people that think that this is just a bunch of hooey and why should I do this with my horse and you're gonna get the horse that won't stand on a sure foot pad because they're out there or you're gonna get a horse that reacts badly because they're out there and I always tell people it's not the middle of the bell curve you have to worry about it's the edges, it's the places, the thin edges, the few horses that have some not typical response, like the one that when I was showing Linda Tellington Jones and she had come to watch me do a surefoot, uh, surefoot with a couple of horses and I had two horses that were under saddle and it was all normal and the horses all got more relaxed and they moved more freely and everything was great. And then I said to the barn owner, do you have a difficult horse? Oh yeah, we have Huey. He's ADD. Great. Bring out Huey. So they bring him out on a halter and I start with Huey. He's a thoroughbred, uh, used to be a jumper. I'm not sure if he raced. Can't remember now. I did each front foot by itself a couple times. I did both front feet a couple times and this horse went wham and fell over, fainted, I think. I don't know. But he laid on the ground for five minutes with his head on the floor with 20 people standing around him and with Linda Tellington Jones standing there. And I was having an absolute heart attack. I thought I killed my first horse with Surefoot. And, you know, like she wasn't running over to do ear pulls or anything or any tea touches. And so I'm like, okay, he's not dead. And then she, oh, look at he's breathing. And I look over it, okay, he is breathing. And then it was, so Wendy, <laughs> this is the funniest part. Wendy, tell me about the most interesting thing you've seen with Surefoot. You mean besides killing this horse? <laughs> Couldn't believe she asked me that question. Um, and after five minutes, this horse got up, shook off, and was fine. And what you have to realize is we never asked the owner's permission. The owner was not there. 
So, you know, this is where, <laughs> now I would never do that again. Um, this is where, you know, being comfortable working with a bunch of different horses is really important. Doing some case histories um, is really important. Um, I did a workshop uh, over in Australia and Joe Watman, who's my distributor over there and become a really good friend, she and her daughter were taking the workshop training and her daughter, then we had really quiet horses. They were, in my opinion, very easy. And then the next day we went to see this jumper because her daughter does thermography and he had damaged his hocks and they wanted to have some more thermography of his hocks. So we went over, she got him out of the field, she took his rug off, she did the thermography, he was on crossed ice in the wash rack, he was a you know totally handled horse, and said, okay, let's use him for a case study for you. We took him outside into an open space, and he wouldn't pick up his left front leg for her. And then, so I said, well, you know, okay, go over to the right side, and she picked up the right front foot and put it on the pet, and he completely freaked out, like jumped away and was freaking out, like, you know, what the heck did you do? And that's when Grace realized what I was trying to explain. It's not the horses that are easy you have to watch out for. It's the other ones. And you never really know until you get there. I mean, there's certain little signs if you see them cock their head or ear or blow a little bit. And those are huge signs to pay attention to. But, you know, there is uh, that piece that there are these outliers they're rare. I've had two horses literally bronk off the pads and thank God no person was on them. Um, and, you know, I, it's a very small number, but they exist. And so we're always working toward the outliers, not the middle of the bell curve, not the easy horses that you put their foot on the pad, they take a big breath, they drop their neck, they go dreamy. I'm always watching out for the horse that is adverse to the pads. I had one, I literally was, you know, 15 feet away and he saw the pad and he was running backwards, <laughs> like literally. Um, adverse to the pads, does not realize they're standing on a pad and then freaks out when they discover it, like that horse. Um, has an adverse reaction, like the one that fainted um, or explodes. There's not many, but they do exist. And so again, it's the safety factor that's so critical. I know it's a crazy story and it's true. <laughs> and Linda was there and I had lots of witnesses. Um, and so that's the, that's the thing is, I know in eight years of doing this, what the possibilities are. Have I seen everything? No, I just watched a video with Laura Plunkett last night that she, on her webinar that I had, that a horse did this whole extension and stomping with the back foot and switching back feet in a way I have never seen before. So there's, you just don't know what's gonna happen and you always have to set yourself up for safety and success. And so that's the key, um, which is what drives so much of what I, I talk about and what I teach. Um, because if you're not paying attention to the little signs, and this is where I love Sharon Wilsey's work, and by the way, she'll be back on Monday with another webinar, um, is to learn how to read the subtle signs that are telling you yes or no, go or stop. Um, and so that's always, always what I'm concerned about. Okay, so I think we're gonna head back over to the website again. Um, share. Right, so we have the different four hoofs. It has the explanations. Like I said, I'm still kind of hashing out this two hoof a little bit because it says give demos to small groups now. Um, and I just want to clarify the two and three hoof. The one and four hoofs, it's easy. It's, it's the middle group I just have to get sorted out. Um, we have a calendar, um, which right now doesn't have anything on it. <laughs> so there's nothing there. Um, but when you are a Surefoot practitioner at the two, three, and four hoof level, you will be able to log into the website and list your workshops, clinics, and pad parties and demos. So um, what we're going to have when you enter into the login is a place where you can list that kind of information and also a place where I can put things up for you guys that you can grab, like the logos. Um, different, uh, we have um, uh, case study sheets. Oh, that's right, I forgot to send those to somebody. Um, case study sheets that tell you, you know, give you a, a, a sheet to follow to do 
write up your case studies. You can do them in video. You can do them in written form. But this login, we're going to start um, fleshing out. Right now, there, you know, there isn't anything there, but we've got it in background. Um, we're going to flesh it out so that it's a place where, you know, if you have a question and you don't want to ask the question public, you want to ask your peers, you can go there. Um, you can grab PDFs, you can get logos, so you can go in and get stuff there. Um, we also on Facebook have a Surefoot Equine Professionals page, which is a, um, a it's not a public group, it's a pri private group, and it's also a place where you can interact with your peers, you can go and ask questions, you can share stories, different things that you want to publish. You should be, you should put the webinars on the calendar. Oh, not a bad idea. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, we just launched the website on Monday, so I'm still, no, 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 Friday. So I'm still kind of, uh, uh, we're still mashing out. Right now we're working on the, on the photo gallery because it's not quite right yet. It's not totally up. Um, but yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so the, the whole idea is that I want to develop more of a community. And where I see that happening, which is really exciting, is on the fans page. So on Facebook, we have the Surefoot Equine page, that's the general public page. We have the Fans of Surefoot Equine group, which is a public group. It's been growing like crazy, and that's where people post questions. You know, has anybody, and I don't think anybody's answered this one, but has anybody used Surefoot with horses that crib, and what have they seen? Um, it's where people post videos of their horses on pads or tell stories. So um, it might be somebody who doesn't really know a lot about Surefoot and is looking for, you know, what pad should I get? And what's really nice now is the community is very, it's forming and people are going in and answering. Um, I don't have to answer all the posts anymore. I just love it. Um, it's really nice. And I think that makes it a richer, uh, more inviting group because you get different perspectives and different things people have tried. And I think that just is, it's really what I wanted to see on the fans page and it's happening and it's really exciting. Um, so the equine, Surefoot Equine Professionals page is just for people who have either um, uh, their, uh, what's the word? I forgot the word. They've either Surefoot practitioners or they're um, in the process. They may not have put up their case histories yet, but they're in the process. And so I just add them to the, to the professionals group. Um, yeah, I know. I, 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 it'd be nice to see if we could have an answer for the cribbing. We need some people to do a little study on that. Um, with a bunch of horses that crib. But you know, that, that would be actually a really interesting project for um, like a university who has a bunch of horses that crib to see if it would work. So we are starting to get research. It's very exciting. Um, it's been slowed down by the pandemic, um, but we have several universities that are looking at doing studies on muscle activation, gait analysis, heart rate, uh, HVR. So that's, that'll kick back up again soon, I'm sure. Um, but basically, so that's it. You got the page, you got the fans, and you got the professionals. And um, the professionals basically questions regarding being a practitioner um, or you know people who are becoming practitioners. All right. So um, wow, that wrapped up like more time than I thought it would. Um, anybody have any specific questions that I haven't answered so far? Oh yes, I know one. Um, so. To be at one hoof, you take a two-day workshop, um, and you do your six case studies, and you get approved, and you're a practitioner. Um, a two hoof, one of the things we need to see is that you have some time, you kind of mellow a little bit. It takes just working with horses and doing more horses to be ready for a two hoof. It's another workshop, it's some shadowing at a demo, um, and some more case studies. Um, Again, there's no monetary, other than the cost of the workshop itself, there's no uh, dues or fees or anything like that. Um, it is really highly suggested and that you, you know, learn more about anatomy, physiology, about the hoof, uh, watch the webinars, educate yourself. Um, and one of my goals, if this thing really grows the way I'd like it to, is that I can either um, tie in with other educational programs at, and get discounts for you or offer educational programs. So, you know, the more we know, the more we understand like Daisy Bicking's course on the hoof, um, which is like, she's coming back as a guest again, but I mean, people loved her information and it was so usable, so easy. Um, and that's just really helpful. And Martina's information, like 
just looking at the angle of the cornet band of the back foot, and whether it hits below the knee, at the knee, or above the knee tells you what's going on in the foot. Um, you know, this kind of information, educating yourself and expanding your knowledge base, just makes it easier for you to talk to your clients and educate your clients. Um, because Surefoot's not going to solve everything. Nothing fixes everything. But one of the things that Surefoot is so useful for is acting like a magnifying glass. So a lot of people can't see, you know, when you say, well, did you see that muscle twitch? Or do you see that tension line? Or do you see what's happening in that foot? And they can't see it. I mean, they truly can't see it. But when you put the horse on a pad, the pad gives. And now we can say, oh, look, there's more pressure at two o'clock. Um, or, you know, you can see, wow, now watch. And he's kind of shifting around and look at what's happening in the pasterns. It helps people see. Um, and so, the, the, that's a really important thing because if you, if you don't notice it, you can't do anything about it. I mean, how often have you walked around looking for your sunglasses and they're on the top of your head or looking for your car keys and they're in your hand and you can't start your car until you discover that you've got the keys in your hand. I mean, how many times have we done that? Wizard of Oz, actually it's a perfect lead into Wizard of Oz. It's my favorite movie. Um, Dorothy had the ruby slippers on her feet the whole time. She just didn't know how to use them. So we have the answers if we can discover it, if we can see it, then we can do something about it. When we see what's going on with the horse's foot, when we see how it's responding to the sure foot pads, when we see how the horse is responding, we can then investigate further and check out other things, teeth, feet, back, saddle, rider, nutrition, health. We can start to explore those things, but until we can see it, we can't. So sure foot is this, um, it's one of the things I love about it is it's this um, magnifying glass to let us look into this world a little deeper, a little more clearly, so we can start addressing some of these things. Um, you know, I would, yes, maybe horse rescues, and since we just um, uh, are giving away pads, maybe you can contact them and see if they have some cribbers and see if it helps. Um, you know, there's so many different avenues that we could explore, and there's so many great ideas that people have, and right now there's just one of me trying to keep this whole show up and running and at the same time develop new products and uh, find new uh, retailers in different countries. So, you know, if you're ever interested in like picking up the banner on one of these projects, that would be great. Just get in touch with me. And, um, you know, I'm certainly happy to be there as a, a sort of an advisor role. I just can't take any more on right now because there's the whole sure pause waiting to, you know, blossom. Right now it's just a tight little bud and we need it to flower. And um, so it, that's gonna require a, a lot of my time doing all the same kind of things I've been doing for sure. But Well, wow, that hour really flew by. I didn't think it was gonna go that fast. Um, thank you all for joining me. If you think of other questions afterward and want to uh, just pop me an email, you can email me at wendy at wendymurdoch.com or you can email me now at wendy at surefootequine.com. We think it's working, so we'll find out. Um, it's great that you've just joined me. I'm gonna keep doing some webinars. I may even do one that's a little more, um, this is kind of nuts and bolts, Surefoot Practitioner, but sort of some of the lecture parts of Surefoot Practitioner. And um, yeah, I mean, we'd love to have you as part of the team. Um, yeah, it is, it is really exciting, Suzanne, and uh, um, I, yeah, and it's just, uh, it's 15 seconds of experiment has taken over my life. It was eight years ago in May, uh, I think it was May, I don't know, it was May 20, uh, 2012, um, but the journey is just so exciting, and I so need to see all these horses improving, and it's just really, really awesome, so thank you all for joining me, and um, Monday, I have Sharon Wilsey coming back um, this weekend. I'll put out the email with all the links. If you're not on my email list, make sure that you join so you get the email and then you have all the links. It makes life easier. Um, just go to murdochmethod.com and join the email list. And once again, thank you for joining me and have a great day. Bye.